1 Samuel chapter 14, today we're talking and we're going to continue the thought. The overwhelming thought is driven. And we're going to continue with what we talked about last week, and that is we are going to chase after God in the year 2022. And so we're calling and we're declaring that the year 2022 is the year of the chase. Now, remember with me, when you were younger, you chased after athletics. You wanted to be strong in, in a particular sport, and so you lifted, you, you tried to eat right, you uh, would follow your particular sports hero, you were chase chasing hard. Remember when you wanted to be first in your class academically? You, you studied. You were chasing. Remember when you saw that, that, that beautiful young lady and you started chasing? Remember when you, you, you met that perfect, what you believed was God's plan for your life and you chased her? I, I want us to understand when you chase after God, it's not a destination. The moment you give your heart to Christ, it's not the end of the chase, it's just the beginning. Because it's a journey. Because I want to know Him more in 2022 than I did in 2021. I want His character, His, who He is, be reflected in my life more in 2022 than ever before. I want to grow in Christ. I want to be a better pastor, leader, Husband, father, friend, I, I want to continue the chase. First Samuel chapter 14, we're going to read the first 14 verses here. So I want you to get the context of what has taken place here. So I think this is very important to our understanding this morning. And we always build upon the word of God and not a thought from man. First scripture, first verse. One day Jonathan said... Son of Saul said to his young armor bearer, come let us go over to the Philistines outpost on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were 600 men, among, him was, among whom was Ajon, who was wearing the ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahub, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozaz and the other was called Sina. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash and the other to the south toward Geba. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come let us go over to the outpost of the uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, come on, then let, let's cross over toward them. And let us, let's let them see us. If they say to us, wait here until we come, we will stay there and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines. The Hebrews are calling out of their holes that they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we will teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me for the Lord has given them in the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In the first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area about a half an acre. Father, we thank you for your word and I ask God that you'll be able to help me today. God, best speak your word that you've placed on my heart to speak. And God, that you would help me go beyond my ability and your power, God, through your word, God, would resonate and would just, uh, God, echo in our hearts. God, not just so that we hear your word, but so we respond to your word. I thank you for what you're doing and for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture teaches us, this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. We have to learn that every day is a gift from God. Moses exhorted the people to pray for wisdom that they would understand how to number their days. 
Life is but a vapor. It appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. If we have not learned over the last two years that we have to be careful not to take people and relationship for granted, then we're missing, we're missing the point. Each day may not be historic, but each day is significant. May we never waste a single day. There are divine moments every day that God gives us. For who knows that He has called us to the kingdom for such a time as this. One man that understood, that really got the importance of living everyday life to the fullest was Jonathan. Jonathan understood that his moment of becoming king really would never happen for him. And I love the humility and the strength that Jonathan had because Jonathan really believed that David, who was not in the lineage of King Saul, it was a monarchy, it was supposed to be Jonathan's to take over as king one day. But Jonathan resigned himself to say, you know, that's not me. But David is truly a man after God's own heart. And Jonathan decides to be David's armor bearer. And, and you think that we would find that, uh, Jonathan in, really in a very insignificant role in Scripture, but it's really the opposite, and it really starts to unfold in, in this passage. There came a day in Jonathan's life, which is this passage we just read, that he decided that life was too precious to waste. On this ordinary, very average kind of day, or so it would seem, Jonathan decides to, to break out of the norm, out of the ordinary, out of the norma- normalcy, and decides that he could do something and become a catalyst that would cause and would bring about a great change. So the account of 1 Samuel chapter 14, you've got to read in context with chapter 13. Because there's a reason why Israel is in Gibeah. There's a reason why they're hiding in dens and caves. And that reason is because Saul, King Saul, had Saul a few little small victories, and he makes an outlandish statement. He says, we're going to war against the Philistines, and we're going to defeat them. And Saul does not do this under under the authority that God gave him or a word that God gave him, but he does this with arrogance and with pride. He says, we got this, we can do this. And so that made the enemy even more mad. And so everything's setting up that there's going to be a battle take place. And just before the battle takes place, the prophet Samuel's supposed to arrive to give, to give the sacrifice. To put the Lord first before there was ever a battle. And so Saul is waiting and waiting and waiting and the prophet doesn't show up when he thinks he should show up. And so Saul takes matters into his own hands and he offers a sacrifice that only the priest was to offer, the prophet was to offer. And so it so changed everything in a moment. And the prophet Samuel, when he arrives, he says, listen, I know what you've done. And you did this with a proud heart. And because of that, your kingdom will be stripped from you. Because because God is looking for a person after his own heart. And so from that, King Saul is devastated. His men are quaking in fear because he's made these such incredibly outlandish statements that we're going to fight against the largest army in the world at that time. The Bible says they were more numerous than the sand on the seas. And now they hide. They're in caves and dens, just hoping the enemy was not going to find them out. And here is the picture. Everybody is scared to death. They have retreated and they're hiding. And then the armies of the Philistines start coming down and raiding what Israel's armies left behind. And that meant that they took all their swords, all their weaponry was gone. 
except for two swords. They plundered their livestock, their everything they had. And now there's only two swords, and guess who has them? Only King Saul and Jonathan. Out of 600 men, all they have now is two swords and some farming equipment, some hoes, some rakes, some shovels maybe. All they have is, is, is things really you, you don't go to battle with. And so change begins and hope erupts one day when you realize like Jonathan that God does not dwell in the cave of arrogance or in the cave of disobedience or cowardice or in the cave of hopelessness because that's where they were living. They were living in this place just hoping that, that this would pass. That their head was in the sand just hoping against hope that something would change. But we know that God resides in the mountains, on the hills. The scripture teaches us that I will lift my eyes to the hills for where my help comes from. My help comes from the maker of the heavens and the earth. Jonathan realized that he wasn't going to be like everyone else and just hoping against hope that something good would happen, but that Jonathan needed to find out where God was going and he needed to go the direction that God was taking him. You see, you can't go with God and stay where you are. I'll just stay right here where I am and in and, and a place of comfort and a place of ease and a place of panic and a place of despair and expect anything to change. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, let's go over to the, to the enemy. Perhaps the Lord will work on our behalf. He'll do something for us. The main point of the story is not to propose a military strategy of picking a fight with a superior enemy, but Jonathan's actions reveal that he was going and he was chasing after God. Throughout Scripture, we find the go principle over and over and again. He said to Abraham, I want you to leave the land of the Ur of Chaldeans and I want you to go in search of a promised land that I'm going to give you. I'll show you later. There was no GPS there was no map. There was nothing. He just said, go. Moses, is he, he said to go. Throughout the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, Jesus said that we as a church are to go. Jonathan and his young armor bearer, incredibly, incredibly brave actions. Their story represents what it's like to take a great risk when the odds are stacked against you. You see, when you chase after God, you'll find yourself chasing after an enemy that truly has come to kill, steal, and destroy. All the while, all of the other 600 men, the fighting men of war, were quaking with fear. Jonathan says, I'm done. I got to get out and go after God. I got to chase after God. I want to give you several things to consider. First of all, Chase even when all you have is a perhaps. Perhaps. Jonathan says to the only one that would listen, hey, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. You know what a perhaps is? Perhaps is a maybe. Perhaps is, I uh, hope so. Perhaps is um, possibly, perchance, I love the honesty in this text because Jonathan had not received a word from a prophet or a priest. He had not received a word from even a fellow soldier. King Saul was not even aware that they had left. But Jonathan says, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. This is the year that I'm encouraging you to chase. And in the chase that you are to chase after God, I want you to know you're not always going to know what's going to happen if you step out. You're not always going to know how it's going to go down. You're not always going to have such confidence and such assurance, but I want you to go even if all you have is a perhaps. What is perhaps? Perhaps is faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. It's a perhaps. 
We don't know how it's going to turn out, but we, when we come to Christ, we are exercising our perhaps. Perhaps God in his love and his mercy will forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Perhaps he'll take this weight that I've been carrying around, which is my sins, which is my mistakes, which is my baggage from my past. Perhaps he'll take it and he will forgive me. Scripture says that we are to be on the offensive and not on the defensive. They tell us defense wins championships, but you got to have some kind of an offense to win. Even if it's three to nothing in a football game, you got to have an offense. As the church of Jesus Christ, the scripture says that the kingdom of heaven will suffer violence, but the violent take it by, everybody shout force. So I want you to understand, we, we make this thing more complicated than what it is. When David went to take his brothers some food for the battle, all he had was a perhaps. When he stood before Goliath, he, he was not given an assurance by the king, King Saul. He was not told by anybody. In fact, he was rather discouraged by his older brother Elab and said, go home and take care of those few sheep. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time. You're just a little boy. And David took his slingshot and didn't even allow the king to put armor on him because it didn't fit. And he said, you come to me with a spear and a sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And this day your head's going to be taken from off your shoulders and God is going to be glorified and that's exactly what happened. But David, all he had was a perhaps. Everybody shout perhaps. perhaps. What is per perhaps is exercising your faith. Pastor, I'm struggling with drugs. I'm struggling with alcohol. I'm struggling with my marriage. Why don't you take that and give it to God and say, perhaps you can set me free. Perhaps you can turn this around. I've seen God do more with a perhaps. Use your perhaps to work for you. Life's too short to analyze over and over again. Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if I do this? What if I don't do this? What if I do and what if I don't? We are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Chase after God with a knowing that nothing can hinder the Lord. You have to have a confidence and a knowing in your heart. I've witnessed so many miracles as pastor. I've seen so many things in people's lives and I'm so appreciative for seeing those things. I've seen miracles in our three sons. I've seen, I've seen it play out before my very eyes. And so I know nothing can hinder the Lord. It's like sometimes we have amnesia. Because we get to a place and we think, well, the word nothing, let me break it down for you, in the Greek, in the Hebrew, in the Aramaic, in, in all, it means no thing. Isn't that deep? <laughs> Bring it together, it means nothing. Wow. No thing. But we, we tend to do it like this. I know it says nothing. I know it says no thing, but you don't know what my boy's like. You don't know what my daughter is like. You don't know what the struggle that I'm going through. And so we take that nothing or no thing and we cross to it and we make an exception and we say, except for God is, can do anything, but he can't do this thing. So I want you to understand nothing can hinder the Lord. From saving from many or from a few. It doesn't matter with God. If it's cancer or if it's COVID-19, He's still God. But pastor, I had a friend who died with COVID. I had a friend who died with cancer. I understand that. I don't understand all of what God is doing or what he's going to do in 2022. I still stand on the promise that nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Nothing. Not your past, not your talent, not your ability. Not your education, nothing. 
Thirdly, chase together. This is important. Chase together with your armor bearer. Jonathan needed a friend. There was nobody in the camp that was going to listen to him. They were all quaking in fear, hoping that the enemy wouldn't find them out. You need a friend. You need someone who believes in you. You need someone that builds you up and not tear you down. You need someone that is honest with you. You need something, someone that will tell you the truth when you don't want to hear it. You need someone, and that someone cannot come except from the house of the Lord and the faith and the body of Christ. I don't want you getting your information from Dr. Phil or Oprah. I don't want you getting your information on Facebook. I don't want you to get your information on TikTok or whatever latest, greatest platform there is out there. Don't do it. It's baloney. You need to be encouraged to be built up by the people of God. Let me, let me rephrase that. You need to be encouraged and be built up by the people who you know you see fruits of being a woman or a man of God. Amen. They need to have fruits. Okay? Don't assume because they've been to church for 52 years that they are solid in their faith and they have a great foundation. Now, I'm going to be, be blunt with you. Look at their fruits. Okay? They can say they're spiritual, but if they can't hold their tongue, they're not. They can quote scripture, <laughs> but if they gossip, they're not. They can look the part, but they not may be able to live the part. And so we need an armor bearer who's going to build us up, not tear us down. And we need someone that we can depend on. Jonathan had a young armor bearer that said, I'm with you with my heart and with my soul. Do not do life alone. Discovery Church is not a place where lone rangers hang out. Even the lone ranger had Tonto, right? That was the Indian, right? Okay, I was hoping it wasn't. His horse was silver. That's what it was. Okay, I got it. You need my armor bearer. I have several. My dad, my wife, my father-in-law. About nine years ago, there was a guy that came into my life that was, he rededicated his life to the Lord. And he came to me and he said, I want to be your armor bearer. And I said, really? I said, you know what that means? And he said, not really, but I'm going to study about it. He came the next morning. He came early for prayer a lot before I would even be here. And he would say, I want to be all I can be to help you. We had just begun talks about building this facility. Just began it. And he came to me, and listen, he, he said, Preacher, this is too small. And I said, Joe, we didn't even fill half of it up today. And he said, it's too small, trust me. He would walk this campus and pray. He would literally show up. It didn't matter if I was in a meeting. His time. Now, he wasn't hateful about it, but he always, Pastor, I need to talk to you. God gave me a word. For about nine years, he was my armor bearer. There are some things that would not have happened, if I'm being honest with you, without his putting courage into me. It's called encourage. Amen. You see, you need courage, but before you can have that courage, someone's got to pour courage 
into you. Hence, encouragement. Woven in the fabric of this story is the importance of being very selective with people who you allow to be close to you. Don't just say, any, many, money, mo." You need to have discerning of spirits and say, I'm going to pray about this. Now, be friendly with everybody, but be on guard with who gets real close. Hear me. I love my church family. I love you. But if I tried to listen to all the voices, I would be so confused and so messed up. I need to listen carefully to the people that I've allowed in my inner circle. There are dreams, there are passions, there are visions God's given me for our church that before I ever talked about them from this stage, I talked about them to my wife. What do you think? I talked about them to my dad. I talked about them to my father. I talked about them to David, to Bud. We had executive board meetings. What do you guys think? To Lance, to Jason, to Marcus, all these guys. I know there were times I wanted, I, I, really, I, I really believe they wanted to say, Pastor, you're crazy. But they never did. And I know that they would tell me, they would say, Pastor, we believe in you. We trust you. We know you hear from God. What they're saying is we're with you heart and soul. Discovery Church has to be a church about being with each other heart and soul. If you want to be critical of Discovery Church or the leadership or the people thereof, stop it. We're not perfect. Listen, we are not anywhere close to perfect, but I can promise you that we'll be real and authentic and we will love Jesus with all of our hearts because that's what we're made of. We're made of, of imperfect people that have lived jacked up lives, but they've come to know a Savior that loves them. Come on. And we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. We're going to be armor bearers. And listen, if you're really going after God and you're chasing after God, not everybody's going to agree with every decision that you make. Not everybody's going to love you and applaud for you and say, I, oh, it's the best thing ever. This week I was reminded of that. You know, isn't it crazy when your confidence begins, your self-confidence begins to grow a little bit and God says, let me take care of that for you. One of the person I trust very much in the office on Friday, he said, you must be doing something right. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you got some real bad reviews this week. <laughs> and I said, great, great. It's not that I'm not used to it. I've gotten several. But they happened this week. And I wanted to say, I'm a good preacher. I'm a good person, you know. So I thought, I'm going to shake it off. Everybody, everybody shake it off. <laughs> Come on, shake it off. I shook it off, but evidently it didn't all get out of it. Because I get home and I'm, 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 I get on the computer. And I read both of them. I don't even know the one lady. I have no idea. I think she confused us with some other church in town. Seriously, I really do. I don't know who she is. But the other one, I know. And it's something that happened two years ago. And I read it, and I'm like, ah. Martha came in. I'm kind of going over my notes, but I'm kind of looking, looking at the review. And she's like, honey, put that down. That don't matter. And I said, I should have said Amen. I didn't. I said, and I don't know if I said these words, but I, she teaches school. 
if one of her classmates reviewed her and gave her a bad review, she'd be whining and crying. <laughs> Finally, I, you got to get over what people are thinking about you. Whether you're leading or you're the armor bearer. And let me tell you, this is important. Everybody has both roles to play. You have to lead, but there's also times you need to be someone's armor bearer. You never graduate to the point that you are such a leader that you can't be someone's armor bearer. Pride says, no, I'm just going to lead. No. I've learned this week, I've got to come alongside our three sons and be their armor bearer. Because they're leading. Jonathan was surrounded by people with excuses. They had several legitimate reasons for staying in a cave of defeat and despair. The Philistines were too strong. All they had was two weapons. And, 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 but to really experience the power of God, you've got to sever ties with those that prefer to hide in the cave. And you've got to get out of the cave yourself and say, I'm going to chase after God. Armor bearers are a must. Paul had Timothy. Timothy needed desperately a leader to step into his life and say, I, I know because I laid hands on you and your grandma and your mom, and now that same spirit resides in you, but just stir up that gift, Timothy, that, that's within you, and God will use you for his glory. But before Paul could ever pour into Timothy, Barnabas had to pour into Paul. It's a cycle, friends. I need your pouring in to other people in this church and other people pouring into other people at this church. We need each other. That's what the church is for. Nobody's a lost cause. I've seen people over the last 18, 24 months get out of church, but I'm seeing them come back now. And it's because we weren't judgmental or condemning, but we loved them, called them, and encouraged them. And God brought them back through His grace, through His mercy, and through conviction. Aren't you glad that God is reaching prodigals in our generation? Can you say amen? Jonathan's armor bearer would have never been so able to put courage into the leader of Jonathan had Jonathan not put courage into him. It works both ways. Moving on, get you a sign as you chase. Everybody needs a sign. You got to have a sign. Jonathan said, this will be our sign. He said, if I, if I yell up to the enemy and I say something like this, hey, you guys want to come down and let's fight? Then if they say no, then we'll just wait. But if we, so that's what happened. And then the next time he said, hey, hey, this will be our sign. If we say, we're coming up there to fight you, um, y'all want some of this? If they say yes, that'll be our sign. That is the most stupid, ridiculous sign in the world. Let's be honest, because they had the high ground. Why wouldn't the enemy say, come on? One weapon among two men. <coughs> it's it's, it's kind of weird the way we do with signs. We, we were like, if Pastor Kevin wears turqu turquoise socks today that don't even match, I'll know that I've heard from God. Well, you're in luck today, okay? Because I didn't even know turquoise was a color until Carter says, Daddy, you got turquoise socks on today. And if, now some of them add to, we don't just get one sign, and if he uses the word espionage, <laughs> that'll be my sign. Quit with your stupid signs. If sister so-and-so calls sister 
and brother so and all these different kinds of signs. And if I get to work tomorrow and they tell me that I've got a $30,000 bonus waiting on me, I'm going to give you a sign this morning. Very simple. Chase after God. Quit chasing after stuff. Quit trying to find you a sign. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, the Jews seek after a sign, but the Gentiles seek after wisdom. Jesus is saying, don't seek after a sign or wisdom. Seek after God. Jesus would perform a miracle in the Gospels, and many followed him. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, would say after he performed a miracle, they would say, do it again. If you would just show us another sign, we'd believe. If you just do another thing, we'd believe. You know what? Jesus got so done with that, he says, no more signs. What if Jesus said, no more signs for you? Would you still serve him? He didn't have to prove anything else, friends. It's sign enough that he saved you, that he set you free, that you're on the right path. God's doing a work in your life. You don't need another sign from God. Quit seeking a sign and start chasing after God. Chase hard after him. With everything you have, chase after God. Erwin McManus defines having a victory mindset as barbaric in his book, The Barbarian Way. Victory is not for the tame, he says. It's not for the timid. It's reserved for those few who walk to the beat of a different drummer. Yet Christianity over the last 2,000 years has moved from a tribe of renegades to a religion of conformists. A quick survey of the modern church would lead you to believe that Christ's invitation to come was to come and see and, and come and listen rather than go. Like the soldiers in Saul's army, the tendency is, re- is to retreat in the face of the enemy and retreat in the face of adversity, in the face of threats and difficult trials, instead of going where God is leading us. We can't afford to live in the dusty caves hoping to not be found out. But we are to be people, especially in these days, to not want for form, but rather power. Paul told Timothy, he said, I want you to tell your people, tell your church, but I also am sending this out for the church in 2022. Do not seek after a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Go after his power. As a church, our words are only this much good. I'm going to do my best to preach under the anointing of the Holy Spirit because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. But I can promise you, we have not come for a demonstration of man this morning, but we've come for a demonstration of the power of an almighty God because he can do more in a moment than we could ever do in a lifetime. Can you say amen? amen. And so it is so powerfully important. It's not about forms. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. It's about chasing after the heart of God. Christianity, if we're about form and pattern, we are substituting for power. And because of that, Christianity just becomes another world religion designed to keep us in line with all the other people in the cave. So keep chasing. Last point. Keep chasing until God sends a panic. I read down to verse 14, but I'm going to read verse 15. Because you got to know this. Verse 15 says, Then panic, after Jonathan and his armor bearer had killed about 20 in a very small space, then panic struck the whole army. Those in the camp and the field and those in the outposts and those in the raiding parties and the ground shook. Listen to me. And it was a panic sent by God. Now, 
over the last 24 months, we all know what a panic looks like. We all know what it's like for schools to shut down. We all know what it's like to distance learn. We all know what it's like for you to quarantine. We all know what it's like for your job to be in jeopardy. We all know what it's like to say that there are no more beds, ICU beds in the state of Oklahoma. We've heard all those things. We've all heard we are to social distance. We've all heard you're to, you're to get a vaccine. We've all heard you wear a mask. We've all heard people say masks do no good. We've all heard these things. What is all that? It's panic. Now, I'm not saying that some of it has not been good. Don't get me wrong. Hear my heart. But I'm saying the source of the panic has come from Satan. Because Satan loves panic. He loves that fear drives the panic even more. Panic says, I'm going to stay in the cave. I'm going to stay at home. I'm not going to go to church. Because what if this happens? What if that happens? Listen, we're going to come out of our homes and out of our dens and out of our caves in the year 2022. And we're going to grow the church of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see people saved that need Jesus as their Savior this year. God's going to do some awesome things in our church. We're going to see miracles. We're going to see deliverances. We're going to see those things because you'll never see them if you stay in the cave. It was a panic sent by God. Now we think something of that magnitude and proportion has to start with a bunch of people. It doesn't. It all started from two. Jonathan and his armor bearer. All we need is two. But what if I get two and you get two? And you get two and you get two and you get two and you get two. two. And you get two, and you get two, and you get two. You get the idea. And you believe God. And they believe God with you. My prayer in 2022 is Discovery Church would give Satan nightmares. That he would, when he sees you wake up. He gets so panicked. He's like, oh no. They're up again. They're praying. They've called their friend. They've called their their armor bearer and they're praying. And I'm freaking out right now because it's a Sunday morning and they've prayed before church. And they're going to, they, that's, Silly pastor is going to give them an opportunity to come to Jesus and, and they're coming. I just know they've been coming. They're going to come. I know it because people in that church have been praying for them. I'm praying for panic. The hardest, the hardest sinner. Students, I'm praying for panic. Your daddy that you think will never be saved. I'm praying God saves them. I refuse to sit idly by while people are dying and going to hell. So I'm praying for panic. That the enemy is scared to death. Pastor, could that happen? Oh, definitely. Definitely. About three years ago this month, on Sunday evenings, we, we came out and we had a time of worship. And we passed out mark, markers, permanent markers. And people wrote on the concrete. Before the carpet was, this was just concrete on this stage 
And I watched as many of you wrote scriptures. And there's a couple people that just asked for my permission. Could they, could they say something to me? Underneath where I'm standing are some of my armor bearers. They wrote things. Pastor, I'm praying for your anointing. One of those armor bearers wrote names all over this building. No joke. He would come out through the week. It didn't have to be a special Sunday night. And he'd just write names. I said, why in the world? He said, because I'm brand and I'm believing. And as I stand on the promise after I've prayed over them, they're going to come to know Jesus. I believe with all my heart that caused a panic in the enemy. Friends, I need you to know we cannot stay in a den in a cave or even in our seat this morning. We've got to recognize this is the opportunity that the enemy is trying to hide from us. Quit living in a state of fear. There's an opportunity before us. Let's cause some panic. Let's freak out the enemy. So that means church can't be as usual. I'm glad we have a worship team, but listen, if you feel God moving in a worship set, this is a place of surrender. Where you're standing is a place of surrender. Pastor, I feel like shouting. I feel like running. Do it. Pastor, I, I, I feel like, like I need to go downtown, home, Oklahoma City, and pass out, pass out meals and pray for people. Pastor, I feel like I need to radically, boldly preach at my high school. Do it. Pastor, there's someone I need to go pray for in a hospital. Do it. I, I need a word, Pastor. Give me a word before I can do it. Let me give you one word that we've already covered this morning. Perhaps. Amen. Step out. Even on a perhaps. Pastor, I've been struggling with this addiction for 15, 20 years. Well, step out with your perhaps today. And God will honor that perhaps your faith. Just don't stay in a cave. Just don't stay where you are. Would you stand with me, please? Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, you know the importance of your word. You spoke this world into existence and you gave us your written word. But the most important importance of your word is for us to respond to it. So God, I pray for a great response today. That people would not leave here like they came, but they would be changed. Not by my words, but by your power. In Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Please, nobody looking around. I want to give you an opportunity. The most important of all, of all life's questions is what are you going to do with Jesus? So you came here this morning, brought your baggage with you, you got your past with you, you got your sin with you. God looks past the sin 
and he sees the cross. He sees that his son went to the cross of suffering and shame, and he died for your sins. You need Jesus to forgive you of sins. Let's make it real simple. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you come to this front. You need Jesus to forgive you of your sins. I want you on the count of three. Just raise your hand. I'm not going to single you out in any way. You need Jesus to forgive you. Step out of your perhaps, on your perhaps. I want you to envision, hey, God is going to take care of your past. He's going to take care of that hurt. He's going to take care of that pain. You need Jesus on the count of three to forgive you of sin. Raise your hand. I want to pray with you. One, two, three, all over this place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody in the house, I want you to say this with me. Say this prayer with me. I need our team to be ready to come. In just a moment, I need you to pray with this prayer with me. Jesus, come on everybody. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Please come into my heart. Save me. I know I'm not good enough, but nobody is. So save me. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth. So I am saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Come on, give Jesus. Now, this is what I want us to do because this is about vitally important. Every person that raised their hand, there's about 15 people that raised their hand. I want to, I'm not, I didn't, I told you I wouldn't embarrass you. But I do know it's important for us to receive prayer. If two or three agree is touching one thing, it shall be done. I have had more calls this week, Pastor, there's a situation. Can you pray for us on Sunday? Can your team pray for us on Sunday? Listen, I do not know if God is going to heal you today or your son or your daughter. But what I do know is perhaps... What I do know is it won't happen unless you get out of the cave, unless you get out of your seat, unless you say, God, I'm giving it to you. And it may not be your child, your son or daughter that's sick. It may be you. It may be your marriage. It may be. But listen, I want us to understand there should be no shame or embarrassment because we're taking what we have and we're giving it to Jesus. And only Jesus can turn it around anyway. And so I want some people that say, I don't want to live in the cave any longer. I'm not going to hide out because the enemy is attacking me. I'm not just going to hope against hopelessness that everything's going to suddenly turn around. But I'm going to step out on my perhaps today. I'm going to step on that maybe. And God is going to meet me today. Whatever your healing need is, whatever your life is going through, on the count of three, you are stepping out and perhaps you're not ashamed of it. If you come all the time or you your first day is today, you need a miracle we sing about a few minutes ago a miracle is happening in this house today you need a miracle from God on the count of three I'm not even gonna we're gonna pray in just a minute but just come around the front if you come from the risers or come from the main floor you come to, to this front people will gather with you and believe God already people are coming I want you to come if you want to bring somebody with you bring them one two three come on right now come on right now give them a hand come on right now You need a miracle. You know the family member that needs a miracle. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. We're going to gather around. Do not think I should be embarrassed. No, we are a family of believers. We're going to pray and believe God with you. Church, now stretch your hand this way. If you know someone that's up here that you're related to, you want to come pray, come on, pray. Keep coming. If you need prayer, keep coming. Church, stretch your hand this way. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for these, okay? Keep coming.